Start to Love and Grit. My name is Laia. I'm Justin. And I'm Rachel. And today's show is all about two very important beverages. One is good for you and the other one is just good. I'm talking about kombucha and beer. <laughs> Philly's own Jamar Jalal of Jambru will join us to break down all mystery behind kombucha. Also, Kevin and Melissa of Love City Brewing are here to update us on the latest innovation and activism taking place in the beer brewing community. But first, our lightning round of Philly faves and the topic, your favorite Philly newspaper. I am going hands down the Philadelphia Tribune. Ah, that was, that was, that's yes. what, we are two women that we are going to support the Philadelphia Tribune. This is the Tribune. first time this yeah. has ever happened. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah man. This blog is a consistently running newspaper. Really? Yes, I don't think they've ever missed an issue. That's amazing. Wow. Yes, and I am very proud to say they have their annual Women of Achievement event where they honor Black women that are either thriving in their industry or making a difference, and I am so excited to, to say. That. Oh, ah, look, look ah. you're doing a little PR here. Right, Jerome, did y'all hear that? Nice. We can cut it out, we can cut that one out. Everybody cut that out. Shut up. That's awesome and well deserved. <laughs> yes. Rachel has articulated that perfectly. I was just going to also say, I was just on the website this morning and it just gives you all kinds of information that you might not be able to get out of your average Philadelphia periodical. For instance, this company launched an online incubator for underrepresented founders in the tech industry. No, well, that's a good true. headline. I, I yeah. think about, I'm sorry, I need to have a little longer time to <laughs> on, this. <laughs> on this Philly Tribune. Yes, because Rachel. Go. I remember when we had Kendrick the Family Soul on one of the episodes for the podcast and they were talking mm -hmm. about their relationship and the quarantine and their family life and it immediately made me think about one of the articles that was in the Tribune and it was basically a, a checklist of how to survive with your partner <laughs> right. during this time like they always have useful information but it's also speaking to the community and elevating issues that sometimes are not covered or um, covered with the same intensity and just really making And perspective. Sure. Yeah. Yes, yes, Dumb. and raising awareness. So mine is the Roxborough Review. I'm going to fight you. <laughs> because I <laughs> used to deliver the Roxborough Review in my neighborhood. But you know what? Community newspapers are important. The Inquirer and Daily News do an amazing job and a yeah. hard time to be in traditional newspaper media. But, you know, you don't get that neighborhood information anywhere. That's true. And so those community newspapers are super important. So Definitely. shout out to the Roxborough Review. All right, now now let the show begin. Make no mistake, Kevin and Melissa love beer. They fell in love over beer, they brewed beer at their wedding, and they opened Love City Brewing. Now that's love. Post-Rona, all things have changed. Kevin and Melissa have followed suit with reinvention and activism. What does that mean in the beer world? We're gonna ask them. You guys literally met over beer. Literally, I think he was filling a pitcher from the keg. Yeah, it was, it was a keg of gangling. Aww. I absolutely adore the name. How did you come up with it? What were your thoughts? <laughs> We wanted a name that called out to Philadelphia. We wanted people to thank Philly when they heard about us. But it's also a note to our relationship. This is our life project as a couple. This is our giant expensive baby. <laughs> <laughs> so that's part of it too. And another piece of it is that we always wanted to create a very warm, welcoming and inclusive space. So that's another reason we wanted a name that just immediately called that feeling to mind. So is it hard working together? Because now I feel like I now work with my husband being that we're home. <laughs> and, yeah. Or in, you know, for so, so long. Some people feel like they work with their kids now. Yeah, and their pets <laughs> and everything. So how do you guys manage that? It's hard to turn it off at night. I will say that during the day, we actually don't see each other all that much. I mean, obviously now, you know, Kevin's on the road, I'm here. We're usually both running in our separate directions doing things. But I will say it's difficult to turn it off in the evening because, you know, we just have so much that went on during the day and we talk about it. But at some point we have to say, okay, no more work talk, we're done. <laughs> so like I go in super early, that's when the brewery schedule kind of works. We tried to get it done before the tasting room would open because the pumps are loud and that kind of thing. So like I'm in like seven, 7.30, Melissa comes in at like 10. And like she was saying, we hardly see each other during the day because we're doing opposite things. So like we have to kind of talk at night and then it's like, next thing we know it's 10.30 and we're still talking work stuff. So we figure it out. 
But at least you know, like, you know, sometimes let's say if you have a colleague, I'm not talking about Justin because he's right here, but let's say <laughs> if you have a colleague and, you know, you're you're working hard and you're passionate and, you know, you love what you're doing and the other person may be like, eh, look, it's, it's a paycheck, it's a job, calm down. It's nice to know that you have that balance and you guys are in it together. That's really special. Totally. I mean, that's that's huge. Having that absolute sense of trust in a business partner, I think is super rare. And I think we do absolutely trust each other. We know where we're at, we know we're on the same page and, and that piece of it is amazing. Have y'all figured out what flavors shouldn't go together when it mm, comes to beer? That's a good I'm just... question. <laughs> it's interesting. Beer was like a very sort of small lane. You yeah. could order a beer or a lager. Now, every kind of fruit I've seen. We don't do a lot of the food beer ingredients that you see a lot of breweries doing. People actually add things like donuts to their beer. I just saw like a whole line of like Dunkin' Donuts beer. (laughs) I mean, we just focus on the classic styles. If Kevin could make Pilsner beer for the rest of his life, that's what he would do. But we really do focus on like the classic, more classic styles um, that are just made super well. You can always count on that they're going to taste like what they're supposed to taste like. That's also one of the problems in the craft beer world. When I started a little over a decade ago, there was like 2,200 breweries in the U.S. I think last time I looked, there was over 7,500 breweries now. And the market has changed humongously. In Philadelphia, it has been a great craft beer market for a very long time. Yeah. Monk's Cafe and the things that Tom Peters over there was doing, he set up an import business to bring in Belgian beer. Um, Mm -hmm. And this was over 20 years ago. That was the only place to go to get like weird beer. Yeah, and he really started a movement over here. And a lot of the craft breweries that were established on the West Coast started distributing. So Russian River, for instance, started distributing to the East Coast just to distribute to monks. So they came to Philadelphia first. They didn't go to New York. They didn't go to Washington. They didn't go anywhere else. They came to Philadelphia first. And it was because of the scene that the bar owners in Philadelphia had established over the last three decades. So Philly has probably a more diverse beer market than any other major city you're going to go to because the West Coast breweries come here before they even go to New York. So we're a wonderful beer city. And that makes it harder uh, as a craft brewery in Philadelphia. I think it makes us better because we have a harder competition to go against. There's a lot of competition in this region. Yeah, the whole region is is great for brewing and beer. I mean, going back to like the history stuff, yeah, the first lager was brewed in the city of Philadelphia, but then German immigrants that settled in Lancaster County were brewing some amazing lager beers too. They called it Little Munich because the water quality out there was pretty similar to what it was in Munich, Germany. There were what, 700 breweries in Philadelphia prior to prohibition. It was a real small local neighborhood thing. And obviously things have changed enormously since then, but if we can in any way sort of replicate that and be, you know, the local neighborhood beer spot and brewing spot, I mean, I think that's awesome. What has this time period, this pandemic been like for you guys? Because the tap room's more recent than the beer. So you have the beer business, but you sort of had, I'm sure, change your business model. Yeah, it felt like overnight we had to do a complete 180 from what we initially had planned on doing. We always knew we were going to distribute our beer into the local area, but we wanted the primary focus to be having an amazing tap room, having a beautiful space where people enjoy coming. So the fact that we couldn't do that, you know, as of March 16th, it was like, you're done. You're not doing that for a good long time. So we really had to to quickly pivot to more distribution. So getting our beer out to more, particularly grocery stores and case stores and things like that. And then we immediately implemented a home delivery program as well, where we're just in our personal cars, driving around the city of Philadelphia, delivering beer to people who order it, because that's what we had to do at the time. I think that's been the toughest thing about the pandemic and this whole situation. There's never a point where you can kind of reach a routine. It's like every week or two, something changes, and then you have to adapt your entire business model to to swing with that. But we have a great team, and we've been able, thankfully, so far to ride with it. But yeah, that's been the hardest thing. So as far as your delivery service, how did that go? You set that up and then people simply knew they could place an order online. And did you, you know, restrict the distance? Because that's just a lot. (laughs) Yeah, it it is. I'm not going to lie. It was a lot. We had an online store for our merchandise. So we just quickly 
added all of the beer options to that online store. So people were aware that that was something that they the could, could was do. There. Yeah, it was there. And we just restricted it to Philadelphia addresses. So we would drive anywhere from far northeast all the way down to southwest. Which is um, far. It's far. <laughs> but uh, it, it was never too much. It was manageable. I mean, it was, it was a lot, but it was manageable. Now we're down to doing it Thursday through Sunday. That makes it a little easier, too. We're not all out driving like delivery drivers every single day. Getting your work out, right? You're like, Argh. Oh, yeah. Lifted all those cases. <laughs> Can you tell us more about the Black Lives Matter initiative and the Black breweries that you guys teamed up with to give proceeds to the cause, please? The world that we live in today is just difficult on so many levels. And we knew that we wanted to do something to speak to the countless people of color that have been killed by police. And this opportunity came up where a brewery in Austin, Texas started a project called the Black is Beautiful Project, where they encouraged breweries all over the country, all over the world, actually. I think they did have participation outside the U.S. to get together, ideally with some kind of business of color or a Black-owned brewery or something, and make a beer and then donate the proceeds of that beer to an organization that helps people of color. So we heard that and we were like, absolutely, we're doing this. There's just no question. It's the right thing to do. I know Tim Harris from Harris Family Brewery, which is the official first Black-owned brewery in the state of Pennsylvania. Wow. Um, we met through our involvement with our state guild. And so I called him up and he was like, yes, we're in, let's do it. And then we met two brothers here in Philly, Richard and Minkes Du Coiler, yeah. who are working to open the first black owned brewery in Philadelphia. And they were all about it too. So we had an awesome brew day with all those guys. We raised over $9,000 that we were able to donate to BLM Philly. Part of what let us do that is also, we worked with Double Eagle Malting. That's another uh, black owned business where you get all of the fermentable sugar and beer comes from malt. So they're a local small malt house just outside of Philadelphia. So they donated a lot of the raw materials, which made it possible for us to do a larger donation to Black Lives Philly. We sold out of that beer in two days flat. That is a wow. record for any beer that we've ever made. It was absolutely amazing. We do have a small amount that we're currently barrel aging. So we don't have any dates for that yet, but you'll just have to stay tuned to figure out when we're gonna release that in the future. I know people can be very intimidating. Like you said, Philly is really the beer capital. And when you come to Philly, you have to be prepared to have a lot of choices. So I'm just gonna ask, can y'all break down how many categories of types of beer there are. So the biggest beer competition in the U.S. happens every year in Denver, Colorado. It's, it's all virtual this year. It's part of the largest beer festival in the U.S. as well, the Great American Beer Festival. That is also the largest beer competition. And mm -hmm. I think last year there was 101 different categories. Okay, Some see. of them had <laughs> subcategories. I know, yeah. uh, but a lot of them are really similar. Like if you take something like a Munich Hellas, it's going to be really similar to like a German Pilsner. So okay. it's nuanced. There's all those categories, but there's not a huge wide difference between every category. Yeah, and you can add any sort of different ingredients to those beers and it'll make it taste different. If I there's don't <laughs> I, I think that's one of the hard things that craft breweries have to overcome too, is making the beer more accessible and doing a good job at welcoming people. And that's not something that beer bars have always done. Beer has sometimes been a very exclusive thing. The price point can be high. You might have a bartender that's kind of snobby about things. So it's not necessarily a welcoming place all the time. So that's one of the things that we tried to do with our, our tasting room. So instead of snobbing out about the nuances about a sour beer, it's about like getting beer in front of people, educating people, having conversations instead of just being elitist about things. It's like taking the lead from the wine industry in a way, right? I know, and that's what's so yeah. crazy. It, it, beer kind of like swung on this pendulum. Beer was always the worker's drink. And then somehow it swung this whole other direction of very esoteric and very nuanced and almost going to the level of that wine world. And now I think finally we're coming back to somewhere nice in the middle where... Yeah, we can all appreciate these different styles and talk about them, but it doesn't have to be exclusive and it doesn't have to be snobby. It can be welcoming, open, and just fun. I'm ready for beer tasting. Let's We're go. gonna have to do a field trip over to the <laughs> like, tap room. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having us. This has been fun. Yeah, thank you thank for having you. us. So, 
kombucha combined with the flavors of Jamaica, also known as jam brew. Yes, I said it. And of course, only a Philadelphian would come up with such an innovative thought. Enter Jamar Jalal, founder of Jam Brew. How does he do it? Why does he do it? And what exactly is kombucha? Because y'all still don't know. So uh, <laughs> kombucha, it is a fermented tea made with sweetened black tea. And then it is fermented with something called a SCOBY. It's an acronym. It stands for Symbiotic Culture of Bacteria and Yeast. So it's pretty much like this jelly-like substance that grows and is alive and it breaks down the sugar, caffeine, yeast and everything in these batches of tea. And then it becomes this sort of bubbly, naturally bubbly, effervescent beverage for you guys to enjoy. <laughs> okay, you just explained something that seems really intense, but you yes. explain it in a way to make us understand. So my Can I explain it to you too, Rachel? It's good with good. vodka. Oh, that is true. It's good with a lot of different... But wait, I thought initially it's supposed to be good for you, right? It is great for you. So it, it promotes gut health. It has a lot of antioxidants as well as bacteria that help with your gut health. It yeah. So tell us how you got your business started. I've been brewing for over two years now and Jam Brew has come from other names. I started with the name Jam Bucha. I started with, I thought that was too on the nose. At the beginning, I started brewing for myself just because I enjoyed kombucha and I was buying in supermarkets. So I learned how to do it myself. And then I would post on my Instagram and friends and family started like asking me what I was doing pretty much and very confused about it themselves. And so from there, I realized like people are interested. And then I started sharing with friends. And since quarantine, I've gotten a lot of publicity and eyes on Jamber itself. You really turned to it because of the pandemic full time, right? Full time. Yeah, exactly. I was working part time, a couple jobs at a time, and I would just be brewing in the background at home when I had the chance. Now with all this free time, I was like, I can't waste any of it. So I just started sort of really going for it and really trying to push it. So how exactly did you learn? Like, did you read something? Did you watch it? Look, I'm trying to see, can I have my own side hustle? Like, how did you, you. really <laughs> that is actually learn about what it? it was. Um, I was reading about fermentation in general, and I was getting more and more interested in it. And YouTube, like you're about to say, is my best friend, honestly. I've learned wow. so many things on YouTube, brewers in different senses, whether it be beer, kombucha, anything else you can think of. And you can just learn a lot about fermentation and it's just a lot of learning. <laughs> no, Let's talk course. flavors. Yeah. I want to know what flavors you make and how you make them and how's your you favorite them. fruit. Yeah. Um, so our, I'd say a flagship flavor right now is our sorrel, lemongrass, and ginger flavor. Sorrel is a Jamaican hibiscus. The whole media family are Jamaican immigrants. I'm first generation. I'm first Mom and here. dad side? Mom and dad. Yeah. Wow. I have two older sisters. They're both born in Jamaica. They both moved here. I was the only one born here and they gave me quite the opportunity to do whatever I could possibly do in this world. So I'm very thankful to them. So sorrel was something I grew up drinking. My mom made it all the time. It's funny, I was making a hibiscus flavor with lemongrass and ginger at one point, And then my mom came back to me and was like, you have to do a sorrel flavor for me so I can have some. As soon as she said that, I got started with that flavor and it was a hit. It's a beautiful red. I have it on our Instagram. It's just like beautiful liquid and it's very well balanced and I really love it. But pretty much the sense of that was the ginger and the lemongrass is a sort of a flavor that's used in a lot of different Asian cuisines and they're always blended together very well. Just from what I knew about hibiscus in general, it went well with ginger. I sort of blended all three together using lemongrass and ginger as well to think of that idea as the combined flavor. We've done a pawpaw peach flavor. Uh, pawpaw is this indigenous fruit to our northeastern region. It sort of looks like a mango, but flavor-wise, I'd like to say it tastes more of like a rich kind of chocolatey flavor. And so with that, I was sort of struggling with how I would blend it with a fermented tart kombucha flavor. So that's where I sort of got the peach. I was like, let me try and balance it out with sort of more of a fruitier flavor. And somehow that worked out pretty well too and people seem to enjoy that one as well i was looking at your your instagram page i'm like jam brew with a u p h l we got it because i'm like no we got to get these numbers up everybody should be drinking this at the very least in philadelphia and every surrounding <laughs> area i'm shocked by how high it's gone already like a, a couple months ago i think we were at like 75 and i remember we were like getting hyped up for like 100 and i'm like Aww. It was definitely a milestone for us, and it's just like been blowing up. What's the future look like? How do you envision building this business? In a more realistic view, and what's coming sooner is expansion, obviously. Right now, we're working on getting our permanent location and like where we want to be growing out of. So we're in the talks with some other companies and working to do some kind of like collaboration space in a way. I've been doing this all out of my own apartment for a, I want to say, 
very realistic, but definitely future goal. I sort of want to bring this newfound skill I have of teaching younger people, making Jambrew or just this business into something bigger than just selling kombucha. I want to make it to sort of a uh, means of teaching the youth in Philadelphia and like greater Philadelphia areas about fermentation in general, because it's something that was very new to me and something I never knew about at all, but it's somehow become my calling. I feel as if I could have missed my calling very easily. And mm-hmm. I feel like there are a lot of people who are probably also going to miss their calling just because of resources and connection to it. When you're not brewing and when you're not laying out plans for the business, what are you doing? Where do you go? Do you have favorite attractions or neighborhoods? And especially now that we can serve as tourists in our own town. I love to bike. I like to go on the trail, obviously, and bike up past the art museum, down Kelly and far as I can go. I've been pushing myself since quarantine, getting some pretty long bike rides in comparison to my usual. Um, in terms of going places, I love ramen in general. So I love neighborhood ramen. They're amazing. I just, I love the whole city. I, there's not necessarily sections that I like. I lived in West Philly for a bit when I was at the restaurant school. I was in Center City for a year. So I got that experience. And now I'm living in Point Breeze in South Philly. So we're all about creating itineraries. We should like have some type of, you know, teachable moment that you share with us so that we can either make a batch or, or just buy a batch. Started and- it's yeah, a lot of work. I'm about to say, I'm, I'm for buying and tasting. Can we do a taste and then put some alcohol in it? No, it's no, such a good vodka mixer <laughs> i've been uh personally I, i'm a gin person and i've done some kombucha gin cocktails and it, you old man weird. what in the old man you drink you know gin? how often i'm told i'm an old man <laughs> oh my goodness can i make a request uh jamar just one request mm-hmm. flavor wise do you have something that would be a good uh iteration of rum punch and feel healthy and still feel good at the same time I yeah think that's mm-hmm. your second request i'm sorry i just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but who's keeping track? Honestly, <laughs> since I'm not an expert on liquors in general, what I would love to do in the future as well as a collaborative thing is find like a Philly-based distiller and do like a collab with them and then talk yes. to them about it. And that's something we've been talking about. And like, because the means of getting these products in general, not just kombucha, mm-hmm. but like all these individual projects, the means of getting it out to people are happening in a lot of different ways now just because mm-hmm. of quarantine. And so, like, I'm thinking the best way for that purpose is to get into, a, say, a certain bar that they can then do a specialty cocktail, a jamber kombucha, and, like, just getting the people who know that stuff best and us who know this hopefully best and bringing us our minds together and doing it that way. But, yeah, definitely. <laughs> and you're doing a great job. I mean, it's great to see your business grow, and hopefully we can help you make it grow. Should I just do a plug right now for everything we have? Please, Please. yes. Okay, so our Instagram is at jambrewphl. It's J-A-M-B-R-U-P-H-L. If you want to follow me personally, which I don't know if you want to, is yes. jamjar333. Also, we have a GoFundMe. That's sort of important for us right now. Yeah. It's just for the Jambrew launch, helping us one with this permanent space that we're looking for. It's gonna help with rent, our equipment expanding. If you guys wanna help out, if you can't donate, please share it. That's all we ask. Well, I'm thirsty. What you gonna start with though? Ooh. That's a good question. I'm going vodka kombucha. Oh, you just put the vodka in there. I thought you was gonna go regular kombucha and then party later, you know, work now. Par- okay, party all day, Justin. I mean, listen, it's a pandemic. <laughs> I really want to experience this and I just feel like as we curate our own itineraries, there's so much to do Mm. and plenty to drink and eat. Our favorite things. (laughs) We've been doing a lot of that. It's just a reminder how dope and innovative Philly is. Also the amount of resources that are available for entrepreneurs and people that are coming up with these new ideas and really their passions. And it makes me think even with what we've done with visitphilly.com jobs, where we created a site, not only for people to have one-stop shop to find jobs within the hospitality industry that, you know, are very diverse, but there's also the resources that are available at a lot of these institutions and people that we've partnered with. I love that we're providing solutions and resolution. That's what's That's up. right. That's right. And fun things to do. And if you like what you hear, tell your friends and like and review and rate us on wherever you listen to us. As Rachel always says, we'll only take the top rating. Only if you're being very nice. Thank you very much. No, but and we're, we're happy to have your feedback and we appreciate you listening. See you guys. Have a good one. Thank you.